welcome. Today we're really excited to have Chris Hansen with us. He's the CEO and co-founder of the Data Bank GBC, a, a global benefit corporation. He's also been a past board president of Metro IBA. Chris is a founding member of MinVest.org, an organization that worked to pass and is now promoting Minnesota's new security fund raising crowdfunding legislation. So we've got a real expert on our hands today and I'm really excited about that. Chris says feel free to text in questions or chat in questions while the presentation is going or also at the end we'll have time for Q&A. And here's Chris with that. Great. Thank you, Jill. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, really pleased to be able to have the opportunity here to talk about this exciting new opportunity that's coming forward for uh, Minnesota businesses, nonprofit organizations uh, to raise uh, capital for their business to help them grow, to help them start. And just a little background on MinVest and this presentation. Um, uh, I want you to know that as we go through these slides that a lot of this content uh, was put together by Zach Robbins. Uh, Zach was one of the two attorneys who were the principal authors of the MinVest legislation, uh, which we were successful in getting passed last year at the legislature. Um, and since then, Zach, myself, and a few other people uh, incorporated a nonprofit called MinVest.org. And uh, our mission is really to promote and educate the citizens of Minnesota about the opportunities that MinVest presents. So. Uh, this is something I'm very happy to do and uh, really look forward to uh, seeing what happens in our community when MinVest finally rolls out and we'll talk about that in a minute. So where I'd like to start out today is really to uh, give you a little uh, overview of security, security law. Uh, I am not an attorney, so uh, please bear that in mind when I'm talking about this. Um, I know just enough about the security law to uh, probably uh, get in trouble with it, but uh, one thing that I will recommend and uh, I will talk about again is as uh, you look at MinVest and the opportunities that it presents that always seek out uh, expert advice, legal opinion on the things you're doing. So we're going to look at the security law, uh, we're going to look at the Jobs Act, which was really in uh, this type of opportunity and uh, then go into specifically looking at MinVest and what does that mean and, and uh, what's happening uh, with MinVest at this point in time. And as Jill said, uh, as I go through this, if you have questions, please uh, uh, type those into the conferencing or, or text those in and we'll be happy to uh, answer as many of those as we can. All right. So, <clears throat> starting out, what are securities? And, and this is really important to have kind of just a basic understanding of the difference because I think we're all familiar with uh, crowdfunding platforms like Kickstarter, Indiegogo. Uh, they've been very popular. There's a number of companies, even local, that have successfully done uh, crowdfunding uh, campaigns. And the big difference here when we're talking about MinVest versus the existing crowdfunding platforms that are out there is Kickstarter, Indiegogo, they don't deal with securities. They're really what are essentially donation-based uh, crowdfunding. And this is different in that through MinVest we'll be able to offer securities. And what securities are, are one, it's an investment of money. It's, it's based on a common purpose or common enterprise, when you invest that money, there's an expectation that you're going to get some type of return on that investment based on the efforts of others. So those are kind of the basic uh, parameters that we qualify what securities are. And now often when someone thinks of securities, they are thinking of uh, equity or shares in a company, so you're buying stock. Uh, well, that's one type of security. Another type of security is a loan uh, because when you loan money to an enterprise, there's an expectation that you're going to get a return on that loan, typically a fixed percentage rate, uh, through the business operations making a profit. So uh, securities can be stock, they can be uh, loans, they can be hybrid uh, investment vehicles like uh, convertible notes where 
uh, you are loaning the company some money, but there's an opportunity to convert that into shares at some point in time. So uh, there's different ways that you can structure security deals. So security laws, and there are federal security laws and there are state security laws. Um, and so it's important to be familiar with both of those when you're looking at offering some type of security. Uh, because they both can come into play depending on what type of security offering you're doing. So basically they tell you how you can sell the securities, how much money you can raise, uh, who you can talk to about the offerings, how you can talk to those people, and finally the right that the investors have uh, to get their money back. Uh, so the security laws really dictate these different things how much you can raise, how you can do that, who you can talk to, who you can raise it from, and how the investors are going to get their money back. So <clears throat> in securities law, and, and interestingly, most of the federal security laws were written in 1933 with the 1933 Security Act, which was really a, a uh, reaction to the Great Depression. Uh, and, and so there's a lot of people that would say our security laws, especially at the federal level, are fairly antiquated uh, because we're still operating under the guidelines that were developed after the Great Depression. And, and as a result of the Depression, most of the security laws are based around who can invest and how they can invest and were done as a protection for average citizens so they would not be lose out all of their retirement money or investment money. So um, we're still kind of dealing with a, a rather antiquated security law. However, uh, MinVest is definitely an attempt to sort of modernize, democratize investment, and we'll talk about that in a bit. But so basically, there are two ways that you can uh, raise securities. You can go through a federal registration with the Security Exchange Commission, and there are a number of different ways that you can do that. So that would be a federal offering. Or you can use some exemptions that were written into the security law that are specific to what are called intrastate or in-state offerings. And MinVest is an exemption to federal security law. We'll go into that in a minute. So one of the issues with uh, filing for a federal SEC registration is it's very expensive, it's very time consuming. Uh, you, why you typically only see large companies uh, that have either a lot of investment money already um, or are growing quite rapidly able to do uh, federal registrations. Um, and it's a very complex process. Uh, it requires a lot of attorneys, a lot of accountants, um, and a lot of time of the company to do it. So this has been an existing limitation in federal security law that uh, we've been looking at how can we get past this to uh, make it more affordable, easier for really any business to do a similar type of uh, offering. So <clears throat> when we're looking at state uh, based or intrastate uh, security registrations, uh, every state has what are called blue sky laws. And the state blue sky laws also have to be followed by registration. So if you're doing, for instance, a federal registration, you not only have to comply with the federal laws, but you also have to comply with each state's blue sky laws in every state that you're raising funds uh, within. So uh, it's very time consuming uh, and very expensive to do this. Now, one of the things that happened uh, in, in 2012, and maybe was the last piece of uh, bipartisan legislation that the Congress has passed, uh, was they passed uh, what was called the Jobs Act of 2012. And the JOBS Act was a bipartisan piece of legislation with the focus of trying to uh, spur business economic development across the country. It was, it was kind of a uh, reaction to the Great Recession and to get more people uh, into uh, 
jobs and, and spur more entrepreneurial uh, activity. Um, there were a number of different parts of the Jobs Act, um, and as they have been rolled out or uh, made available at various stages. Um, they, the different parts were, were referred to as titles, Title I through five. actually. There were five titles within the Jobs Act. Um, this is looking at three of those that are specific to doing security offerings. Uh, and I'm not going to talk necessarily about Title II or Title IV because those are ones that uh, are opportunities that companies could look at. I'm going to talk specifically about Title III here because this is the one that was specific to crowdfunding opportunities, uh, security crowdfunding. And Title III, uh, when it was passed, uh, was viewed as an opportunity for any business to, with uh, not a lot of time or expense, be able to publicly offer uh, security to the general public um, and do that across the country. So there was a lot of excitement about Title III when it was first enacted, um, and we thought it was a lot of you know real opportunity for business. Now, the problem is that the legislation, in order to get it passed, uh, they pulled a lot of the uh, specifics out of the legislation and then uh, placed the burden on to the SEC to develop the guidelines around the actual legislation. And so once the legislation was passed, Obama signed it into law, then the job was given to the SEC to write uh, the rules around how Title III would be enacted. And what happened is uh, effectively the SEC pretty much sat on the legislation for quite a long time. Um, and we were you know, trying to get the SEC to move it forward. There didn't seem to be a lot of desire uh, there to make that happen. Uh, one of the issues that we've run into time and time again with the regulating bodies on this type of legislation is they're concerned that it's going to create a lot of additional burden on them too. And so uh, there, <clears throat> there sometimes isn't a lot of motivation for uh, these entities to move the uh, guidelines forward. Um, so <clears throat> what happened in the ensuing years since 2012, well, they, we were waiting for SEC to move the guidelines forward is some states started to look at an inter, a, uh, exemption, an interstate exemption to security legislation that would allow them to create their own legislation around security crowdfunding. And I believe in 2013 the first uh, law was passed, uh, in uh, interstate law was passed, um, and this is where MinVest, where we started looking at this back in 2014 and started just saying, well, if the federal, uh, if the SEC isn't going to move on this, we can do something here in Minnesota, and that's where MinVest uh, came out. And uh, currently, uh, well, this is as of uh, the end of last year, uh, there are a number of states that have enacted uh, intrastate security crowdfunding legislation, a number more that are in process. Um, and Minnesota, as you see, is one of the ones that uh, enacted the legislation. We got that passed last year. Uh, Governor Dayton signed it into law in June of last year. And uh, in a moment, I'll tell you where we are with uh, MinVest here in Minnesota. So, um, now this, this uh, by the way, this, um, webinar is being recorded. It will be available for you to uh, come and look at again. Uh, so you don't need to memorize this table right now, but this is a very uh, informative table uh, that, again, Zach Robbins put together to really show you the differences, the highlight the differences between some of the different types of uh, exemptions uh, in current security legislation. Um, now, the Title III, as I mentioned uh, before, we were waiting for the SEC to release those guidelines. Well, subsequent to us passing MinVest, the SEC did release the guidelines, um, and uh, actually Title III security crowdfunding will go into effect 
the middle of May um, across the country. So uh, you'll see the second column and the third column. The second column, Title III, is specific to the uh, JOBS Act uh, federal legislation and MinVest is specific to the intrastate or in, in within Minnesota uh, crowdfunding legislation. A couple of the important things to point out between the differences between these two um, because they could be opportunities for you to, you know, both of them could be, um, first of all, the biggest difference is that with MinVest, you are restricted to, uh, it's restricted to Minnesota companies and Minnesota residents doing the investment. So you can only raise money uh, within Minnesota from Minnesota residents. Uh, with Title III of the JOBS Act, you can raise money across the country. Uh, so you're able to, you know, if you're a Minnesota company, you could raise money from people in Wisconsin, California, wherever. So that's a big difference. There's also a couple of other differences as well that are important to point out. And uh, one is the amount of money you can raise through an offering. With MinVest, you can raise up to $2 million per offering. With Title III, you're limited to $1 million. Uh, there's also some differences around who can make an investment and how much they can invest in a particular offering. Uh, in Minnesota, when you do a MinVest offering, uh, you can raise up to $10,000. Any individual in Minnesota could invest up to $10,000 in that offering, regardless of whether they are an accredited investor or not. And accredited investors are high net worth uh, individuals. I believe the parameters are um, they need to have an income of uh, at least $200,000 a year or a net worth of at least a million dollars exclusive of their primary residence. So uh, if you're looking to do in an offering, uh, a couple of the ones on this table, uh, you can only raise money from accredited investors. So that really limits the pool of people that you can potentially uh, raise uh, money from. Uh, with the uh, MinVest, uh, you're not restricted in that regards. Uh, however, the individual, if they are not an accredited investor, is limited to $10,000 uh, per offering. All right. So let's talk specifically about MinVest. Um, as I said, we passed it uh, last uh, year in the legislature. Dayton signed it into law in June. Now, similar to the federal legislation, uh, once the law was signed, then the Department of Commerce here in Minnesota was given the responsibility of devi developing the guidelines around the legislation. And the guidelines are primarily around how portals or where you'll be doing your MinVest offering are um, authorized and the various things that they need to do in order to uh, become an, a, an official authorized MinVest portal. Now, we uh, were a little concerned when the legislation passed and it was given to the Commerce Department as far as how quickly this would be done. Uh, when we talked to them, the only thing we could get uh, from Commerce was that they were going to have the guidelines done in 2016. We didn't know if that was the beginning, the end. Well, where we're at now is uh, Commerce Department developed the guidelines. They went through a public comment period the end of last year. They analyzed the guidelines last month. They sent those guidelines to the governor's office for review and the final sign-off. Um, we anticipate that the final sign-off will happen very soon, perhaps sometime in the next 30 days. Once that happens, uh, the law becomes official and people can start to submit applications for their portals to the Commerce Department. We'll talk a little bit more about the portals here in a minute. So, um, so as I said, uh, MinVest is only available to Minnesota-based companies. All the investors must be from Minnesota. Uh, the portals, by the way, will have to have some capability in their system to 
verify in some way that the investors are Minnesota residents. Um, offerings can only be made through a registered, authorized MinVest portal. Uh, now, you can if you have the wherewithal, the technical skills or whatever to create your own portal. Um, and you can do that through your website and just solicit uh, investments to a MinVest offering through that portal, but you still have to go through the approval process with the Commerce Department. Um, the last point is, is an interesting one, and it's a, a bit of minutia, but uh, a portal, at first when we were talking to Commerce about this legislation, they were saying that they felt that uh, portal operators need to be, needed to be a registered broker-dealer, uh, which we saw as really a, a big problem. In other words, if you were going to do an offering, you had to have a broker license uh, in order to do that offering. <clears throat> we were able to uh, negotiate with Commerce and get that restriction removed. Uh, so again, anybody uh, can do a portal. Uh, you just need to go through the registration uh, authorization process. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, some of the parameters around a MinVest offering, uh, non-accredited investors are limited to $10,000 per offering, and there will be some process in the, through the portal, through the offering, where people will have to verify whether they are accredited investors or not. Um, you could raise up to $2 million per offering uh, however, if it's a million, if it's more than one million, you will need to have uh, audited or reviewed financial statements. Uh, so that's an important consideration. Uh, doing audited financials can be a bit of an expensive process, and depending on the size of offering uh, that you're trying to raise, might not be worth uh, the money to do that. Um, there will be a lot of Disclosures, uh, you will have to put together a uh, pretty detailed offering document uh, spelling out all of the pluses and minuses of the offering, the risks that uh, investors might have in making an investment in your company. Uh, you, you know, if you've ever read any of these offering documents, they, you know, they're, they're very detailed. And you will need to do that for a MinVest offering. What we anticipate happening and what we've seen in other states that have already enacted this type of legislation and have had a number of uh, successful offerings is that the portals that you can do your offerings through will provide uh, templates and ways to develop that documentation. However, you should still, even if the portal that you're going through has that type of uh, capability, uh, I would still highly recommend that you run any of this type of stuff through a, an attorney familiar with security law, uh, just to make sure that you're saying the things that you need to say. Um, the next bullet, investor funds will be held in escrow until a minimum uh, amount has, target has been reached. And so this is something that you'll need to determine when you're putting your offering together uh, let's say you want to raise a million dollars um, and you set your minimum, though, at $500,000. Uh, what that means is you will not have access to any of the invested funds until you hit that minimum $500,000 target, at which point you will have access to, to the funds um, and you can certainly continue to uh, raise money until you reach that uh, $1 million target. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, portals are going to be subject to very strict, uh, stringent record-keeping record um, documentation with the Department of Commerce. Uh, a uh, question came in, is the offering document similar to the private placement rent memorandum? Yes. I would say that what you see in a uh, PPM or private placement memorandum has much of the same uh, components that uh, will be in a MinVest uh, offering document. 
All right. So what, uh, what are the opportunities here for, for local uh, businesses uh, to raise investment capital? And uh, I think those offerings are, uh, opportunities are really significant here. And, and as someone who has uh, uh, started, co-founded a number of businesses, uh, and has worked with a lot of people who have started businesses, you know, access to capital is almost always the first concern that small business owners have uh, as far as being able to operate and grow their businesses. And traditional channels of investment for small business, uh, families, friends, uh, bank loans, uh, we know when you look at uh, research, is really only meeting somewhere between 40 to 60 percent of the demand. So there's a significant uh, uh, demand out there for additional capital uh, investment into the local or small business community, and we think MinVest is uh, a new exciting channel that some of that gap uh, will be able to be met. Um, but there's some important things to think about when you're looking at a MinVest offering and whether you might uh, be a good, um, it, it might be a good opportunity for your business or not. First of all, this is brand new. I mean, we're kind of in the Wild West here. Uh, as I mentioned, there are some states that enacted the legislation in 2013. Well, that was only three years ago. First offerings uh, went out maybe two years ago. So we have uh, nationally a small sample of successful offerings uh, to look at and say, okay, is this going to be, you know, work well or not? And of course here in Minnesota we don't have any uh, offerings to date, so this is brand new. Um, I think there's a tremendous opportunity, but keep in mind uh, I, I, it's probably going to take a while for MinVest to really gain uh, broad understanding across the uh, citizens of Minnesota. Uh, we hope that, you know, soon once the uh, governor signs off on the guidelines, uh, we'll start to see some offerings come up. I know that there's a number of uh, businesses and groups that are, have been looking at the MinVest and are working to get ready to launch uh, some portals and maybe some offerings soon after uh, the law becomes, uh, comes into effect, uh, but it's, it's new. And a second point, and, and this is extremely important, is that crowdfunding means you need to have a crowd. Uh, so these opportunities don't just happen. Uh, if you put your offering onto a portal, or let's say you do your own portal on your website, the key to making this successful is getting prospective investors to come to that portal and see your offering and determine to make an investment. Uh, so you still need to figure out a marketing strategy around your offering to drive uh, prospective investors to see that offering to get them to invest. Uh, so they're, they're, you don't just put it up and then expect it to happen. You have to have some strategy uh, and implement some strategy in order to make these things successful. Um, and while we think the cost is going to be significantly less than other types of security offerings, uh, there still will be cost involved here. Um, we think that you can minimize that cost uh, significantly, um, especially your legal fees if uh, portals are offering some templates to do the registration, uh, the offering documents themselves, uh, so maybe your attorneys just need to review those things, but uh, realistically don't go into this thinking you can do it, you know, uh, for no cost at all. There's going to be cost involved in this and there will be time involved in it as well. Um, as I said, you'll need to set the minimum, the, your offering amount and the minimum. Uh, look, you're also going to have to figure out how do you want to uh, get the investment. Uh, do you want to sell shares in your company? Do you want to ask uh, investors to make a loan 
to your company, which then you'll need to pay off in some way. Maybe you want to offer a convertible note document where the investor is essentially making a loan to your company but then has the option to convert that to uh, shares or to equity at some point in time. Uh, so how you structure your offering is going to be very important. And that's something that you'll need to determine uh, internally or in collaboration with your, uh, uh, with your vendors, your attorney, your accountant, those types of things. Um, okay, a question came in. When people invest, would they get a receipt uh, in the form of something like a stock certificate or what? Well, that entirely depends on just as what I was just saying, how you structure your offering. Uh, if you're doing an equity uh, or a share sale, uh, yes, your investors then would expect a stock certificate in return for their investment. Uh, if it's a loan, well, they're going to receive a loan agreement, a loan document uh, that details the terms of the loan, uh, what percentage rate you're offering, what the payback uh, schedule is, those types of things that you traditionally see in a loan document. So, yes, the investor will receive back some type of uh, certificate or document uh, specific to the type of investment that they're making. Um, one of the things that to think about uh, in doing a MinVest offering is do you have an existing customer uh, or stakeholder uh, base that you feel you could go to uh, as pr potential investors? Uh, so what we've seen in some of the successful offerings uh, around the country some of, the some of the types of businesses that have successfully done this are restaurants. Uh, in Wisconsin, the first uh, companies that uh, actually drove the legislation in, in Wisconsin were craft beer places. Uh, so they had already developed a customer base that was uh, invested in their product and they were able to go to those very people uh, to get investments from them. So, um, if you have an existing customer base you feel would be interested in making an investment in your company, that might uh, be an advantage for you in looking at an invest offering. Uh, okay, another question came in. So let's say the target is five million. If you have offerings of more than that amount, can you access more than the ask? Um, so first of all, $5 million would not be a MinVest offering. MinVests are limited to $2 million. Uh, if you wanted to raise $5 million, uh, well, then you could look at some of the other, like a title, a 506C offering or a Reg A offering, some of those other offerings on that uh, table that we were looking at where you could raise more uh, than the $2 million. Um, and the, the second part of this, can you access more than the ask? Well, sure. If you are raising, let's say, uh, $500,000 and you raise $750,000, uh, well, you can certainly uh, access all of that money. You're not uh, restricted there. The, where you would be restricted is if you're seeking uh, uh, $1 million and you don't have audited financials and you exceed that, you then would uh, either need, you, you would only be able to access that million dollars. So um, again, you're limited to two million max in a MinVest offering with reviewed or audited financials. All right. Um, as I said, to do an offering, you'll need to go through an authorized uh, approved portal. Um, what we've seen in other states is for instance, again, in Wisconsin, uh, the, men, uh, the craft brewers created their own uh, portal. Uh, so in Wisconsin, if you're interested in investing in a craft brewer, you can go to that portal. You can see a number of different offerings specific to that uh, type of business. Uh, we anticipate here in Minnesota that, that there will probably be similar types of portals uh, started up around specific industries. Um, I know, for instance, that uh, 
Some of the people in the uh, renewable energy community have been talking about this. Uh, we've also uh, had conversations with specific uh, communities that are looking at potentially setting up a portal specific to uh, their neighborhood um, where let's say you want to make an investment in a business in North Minneapolis, there might be a North Minneapolis portal that you can go to uh, to make that investment. So. Uh, as this gets going, gets geared up, it'll be really interesting to see what types of portals come, come together. And uh, as you're looking at this, you're going to want to keep abreast of all of that to decide where you want to place your offering, which portal you might want to go to. Uh, and this is important because, again, let's go back to the crowd part of this. Um, part of the job, we believe, of the portals would be to attract prospective investors to that portal. So it might be to your advantage to go to make an offering through a portal that is generating the type of uh, audience that you feel your offering uh, <clears throat> would be attractive to. Uh, okay, another question, what if you need something small like 60,000, uh, would it be appropriate to, for something that small? Um, sure, it could be. Um, again, uh, it, it uh, uh, kind of depends on, uh, you know, what, uh, what the cost will be through the portal. Uh, what we don't, one of the things we don't know is uh, how portals will generate their own revenue or operate their business. Uh, we've seen some states that the nonprofits have actually started portals kind of as a public service, and so there's a lower cost to making an offering through one of those types of portals. Uh, so you'll need to think about, um, you know, the cost to place the offering on a portal, uh, attorney's fees. Um, if you're just doing $60,000, you are not going to need uh, any type of audited or reviewed financials, so you aren't going to have that cost. Um, but, yeah, it, it certainly might be worth taking a look at. Now, I have seen uh, some discussion about this from other states saying, you know, and there seems to be a general uh, discussion that, oh, you know, maybe 100000 might be a minimum amount, but that's not a fixed thing. So it's something you really need to sort of uh, determine. Um, can portal operators deny your request? This is another question. Um, sure. I, portal operators are not going to be required to take any offering that comes through. Uh, I think how they do that uh, is really dependent on the portal operators themselves, but there is nothing in the state law or guidelines which requires a portal to take any offering that comes their way. Uh, again, this will be something that you'll have to uh, determine when you're looking at doing an offering and talk to the different portals out there to uh, really determine which is the best one, uh, would be the best one for you to do your offering through. And again, you can do your own offering uh, through your own portal if you decide that might be a better way for you to go. Um, so uh, the other two uh, ones down here is, again, uh, depending on how much you want to raise, uh, what you're trying to do, uh, maybe one of the other uh, exemptions might be appro more appropriate for you. Uh, again, you should probably seek uh, legal counsel in determining this uh, to look and see if, uh, you know, MinVest is the right uh, thing for you. Uh, okay, another couple of questions here. Is anyone actively uh, urging the creation of portals? Um, yes. Uh, well, so there are um, a number of companies as uh, this phenomenon has taken hold across the country, there are a number of companies that have created portal software. Uh, so they have the software that creates the infrastructure for portal operators to uh, set up business and to start doing the offerings. So, of course, those companies are very active in promoting uh, the creation of portals. Uh, we have uh, a couple of companies here in Minnesota that have Minnesota roots uh, uh, that are, have already been out there talking to the MinVest community about this. Um, but there is active discussion going on around uh, the creation of portals and how these will get going. And 
one thing I, I, I'll say again is uh, we created minvest.org uh, as a vehicle to share and promote uh, the MenVest offering within Minnesota. Um, and we, we also created a website. So you can go to MenVest.org and uh, we're actually in the process of launching a new website. It will be up in the next 30 days. Um, but it, one of the goals of that site will be to be a resource hub for uh, companies looking to do MinVest offerings, for investors looking for a MinVest offering, and also for portal operators. So we want to be a uh, information and education hub for all of the prospective stakeholders in MinVest offerings. Uh, so please, you can go to MinVest.org right, MinVest right now, sign up to be on the email list, and you, we will be sending out regular updates about MinVest, things that are happening. We also uh, hope to create a directory, a statewide directory of MinVest offerings, uh, so prospective investors could come there and say they want to find a offering from a uh, restaurant uh, in Minneapolis. They could search through that directory, which would then lead them to the specific portal where that offering is happening. Um, let's see another question. Uh, since it's not available yet, uh, how do you do transactions now to accredit investors and then convert to equity later? Well, uh, you would need if if you are doing a security offering. So, uh, if you want to go to accredit investors and say do loans or convertible notes uh, right now, you would have to use one of the existing uh, exempt types of offerings. Uh, there's the registry, the 506C. Uh, there's a couple that are called uh, Reg A. Uh, there's a SCORE offering. So there are vehicles right now, uh, and they actually have been in place for years, uh, where you could do that type of offering. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by then convert it to equity later, uh, but you know, that could be a convertible note. Um, but you can't convert a uh, like a, a 506C offering to a MinVest type of offering. They're two very different things. They require different uh, registration processes. Uh, so they're, they yeah, they couldn't be uh, one after the other type of thing. Um, so um, that's basically it. Um, it's a, it's a very exciting opportunity for Minnesota businesses to solicit investment from citizens of Minnesota. Uh, we think it, it will create a lot of opportunity for businesses that are currently unable to access uh, capital from uh, traditional sources. Um, certainly the startup community is very interested in uh, MinVest. Uh, as well as an opportunity to raise uh, funds for startups in Minnesota. Um, well, I think that's certainly a, uh, a nice opportunity for startups. Uh, I honestly believe that the biggest opportunity here is for existing businesses, businesses that have a track record of success, that uh, needed some additional capital to grow or expand. Uh, to reach out to the citizens of Minnesota and present the opportunity to those people to make a, a nice investment uh, in their business. One of the things that we've seen with offerings in other states is that these aren't the tr traditional, that the successful offerings that are out there aren't nor what you normally see in the investment community where the investor is expecting a huge return on their investment. Uh, in fact, we've seen uh, successful offerings in other states where the interest offered on the investment is in the 2 3% range. Uh, so uh, these offerings are offering a return that's better than someone would get in a certificate of deposit or in their savings account, and that's enough as long as the investor feels that they have a 
high uh, chance of seeing the return on their investment, that's enough to get people to invest uh, in their offerings. So you don't need to promise, you know, five times, ten times return on an investment uh, through these types of offerings. Uh, a lot of people, and these are average citizens, not your, you know, high net worth investors, they're only looking for a, you know, a modest return on their investment. And especially, there's also a social aspect to this, uh, where people like to feel like they're making an investment in their local community, in a local business, that's going to create opportunity, not just for that business, for their whole community. Um, okay, another question. How many non-accredited investors can do a convertible debenture uh, with prior to a 50C, a 506C? Um, yeah, this is where I can offer lots of free legal advice, um, but uh, I'm not an attorney. So I'm just going to say, uh, good question. Uh, you can... Uh, do a search on a 506C and find that out yourself, or you can talk to an attorney who is familiar with security law to get a better understanding of 506C registration. All right, any other questions? Um, if you do, uh, feel free to send me an email. Uh, you can also send Zach Robbins an email. Uh, he is an attorney. Uh, and, um, it, you know, if you have a specific question like this, send it to Zach. Uh, you'll, I'm sure, get a different response than I have given, but uh, also keep in mind that Zach is a security attorney, uh, so it's his business to do this. Um, I'm not sure how much free uh, legal advice he's, he's dishing out, but uh, he can certainly uh, be more helpful on some of those specific legal questions than I, uh, than I am. Okay, another question here. Yeah, where can you get info on the 506C? <laughs> uh, well, you can get it at the Security and Exchange Commission. Um, so uh, just do a Google on a 506C and you'll pull up hundreds, thousands of uh, places where you can get information on a 506C. And again, if you are interested in that, uh, seek uh, some legal advice, a uh, security attorney would be the best place to, uh, to go talk to. All right, any, uh, any other questions? If not, um, I uh, thank you for attending this. Um, slide just popped up, which uh, shows some of the additional things that uh, Metro IBA will be hosting uh, in, in the next month or so. For those of you that aren't familiar with Metro IBA, um, I want to highly encourage you to go to uh, buylocaltwincities.com. That's our website. And Metro IBA is a 11-year-old organization. It's Twin Cities wide. It's focused on supporting local independent businesses in the Twin Cities. Uh, we're a rapidly growing. We have about 350 members. Uh, today and, and are growing at a rate of about 10 to 12 members a month. Uh, it's a great organization to uh, network into other local independent businesses. Uh, we provide educational opportunities such as this webinar to the local business community. We also do uh, a lot of strong advocacy uh, at the local, state, and federal level uh, in support of local independent businesses. So. Uh, I know a number of you are already members, and thank you for being a member. For those of you that aren't, uh, I highly encourage you to go to uh, buylocaltwincities.com, uh, take a look at Metro IBA, and uh, sign up to become a member uh, if you feel it's an organization that you'd benefit from being a part of. I, I highly encourage you to do it. It's been a great uh, uh, opportunity for my business and to get to know other local businesses across the Twin Cities. So thank you again for uh, taking the time to sit in on this webinar. It's been a pleasure to talk to you about MinVest. It's an exciting opportunity. I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens when the legislation actually goes into effect and we can start seeing some offerings. And uh, again, you can go to minvest.org 
uh, sign up to be on uh, the MinVest newsletter to get continual updates on what's happening with that. All right, thanks so much. Have a good day, everyone. Great. Thanks, Chris. I really appreciate your taking the time this morning and talking with us. This has been just an exciting webinar, and I really appreciate all the questions that have come in. There's just a minute or two, so if you've got one last question you want to get in, go right ahead. And for those of you listening by your phones, I'm just going to do a quick review of what some of our upcoming events are in case you can't see the screen right now. We have a Microbiz Networking Lunch, and that's tomorrow from 11.30 to 1. For Microbiz Startups and Nonprofits, it's a free event. Go to our website, findlocaltwincities.com events, and you'll see more about that. There's a listening session for those St. Paul businesses about St. Paul Earn Sick and Safe Time. And this is also tomorrow from 11.30 to 1.30, and that's going to be at the, the Historic Mound um, Theater. We really would love if some of those independent businesses can come and give their voice of what they really want when it comes to the St. Paul Earn Sick and Safe Time. Right now, people are, are assuming what the positions are, but it's really important that we hear directly from the members and, um, and everyone. It's not just members only. It's, it's any small business that wants to come for that listening session. We do have a couple of member-only events, and those are like our business owners' roundtables. It's a chance to get together and really problem-solve with other small business owners here in the Twin Cities. And like Chris said, if you aren't already a member, go ahead and take a look at buylocaltwincities.com, join, and see more about why you should become a member and what we're doing these days. And if you're not, um, we, why aren't you? We're really curious to find out what else we can do and how we can grow the organization. So send us an email at info.metroiva.org and let us know. And also, if you have topics for webinars in the future that you're curious about, let us know about that too. And with that, um, just letting you know, this is recorded. We'll send out links to that recording later, and we'll also post it on our website. So thanks so much, everyone, for coming today. Appreciate it. Bye.